Uh, we're part of the Milchian Hoplites. It stands for M-I-L for Milwaukee and C-H-I for Chicago. Milchian. I represent a Greek hoplite from the uh, uh, 400, I'd say about 490, 480 B.C., time of the Persian invasions. Marathon, Thermopylae, and uh, Plataea. And uh, this is basically a typical uh, type of armor that an average soldier would be wearing. The uh, dory, the spear, eight feet long, would have an iron tip and a bronze butt spike, which is used to balance the weapon so that my wrist is not doing all the weight, fighting the weight of the spear point. So it's balanced with the spear butt spike. And technically this one should be bigger than what it is, more weight, so that the weapon could be held further back and I could get a longer thrust to it, keeping the enemy away. So if my spear point is this far out, the man behind me, his would be that far out, and the man in the third rank, his would be here. So we could fight three ranks deep in that type of uh, weapon. The uh, main weapon, it's considered a weapon, is the shield, or the hoplon. That's where we get our name from, hoplite, or oplite in Greek. Oplite, the H is silent. So the shield is bowl-shaped. What they did is they took wood, they glued it side to side to side, and then they put it on a lathe. There was an actual factory in the city of Athens, and they had something like 300 slaves turning out uh, shields. Now I figure since the Greeks fought in a phalanx, which is eight men across, eight men deep, and they relied on this formation, the weaponry had to be similar, if not the same, in order to operate properly together. So that's why I imagine all the shields were purchased and manufactured, if you want to say according to specs, the same, uh, same size, the same shape. The bowl shape is actually very practical because it rests on my shoulder. I can stand here for quite a long time and not have to get it uh, too heavy for my arm to hold up. If it was flat and weighing, it weighs about 22 pounds. So if it was resting on or holding up by my arm alone, after several minutes it would probably be getting a little lower and a little lower. And of course, you don't want that to happen in battle. You don't want fatigue to set in. So as it rests on my shoulder, on my body armor, it distributes its weight throughout my skeleton and is supported by the skeleton. My muscles are doing very little. My arm is holding it close to my body though. That's about it. It is not a weapon I'm going to be flailing around like you see in the movies. It's more stationary than that. My body armor is called a linothorax. Lino because it's made of linen, the thorax because that's the Greek for the body, is the thorax, it covers the thorax. And it's made, mine is made with a leather core and three layers of linen with animal glue to the inside, four layers of linen with animal glue to the outside. It's flexible, it's comfortable, its weight is distributed again across my shoulders and my skeleton, so it is not uncomfortable. The warmer it is, the more flexible it becomes. However, it retains its strength. It's sort of like wearing a cast, a flexible cast. In the cold weather, it's very uncomfortable in that regard until it warms up. And uh, simply because of that, because when you put it on, it's kind of stiff and uh, not flexible. It's already got its shape from not being on you, shall we say. So anyway, in the warm weather, the Greeks had no problem because they didn't fight in the cold. They fought in the summertime only primarily, I should say. And uh, the main weapons, the shield, the body armor, and the spear. The helmet I'm wearing is a Corinthian-style helmet. And as you can see from here, if we're in uh, close combat, point-blank range, my shield against yours, you see very little of my body. And the helmet is ballistically shaped so that if you do strike my helmet, it'll glance off. It'll either hit the yoke of my body armor or the rim of the shield. The rim of the shield is the thickest point on this shield and usually it was reinforced with a metal covering. But the wood being laid side by side, the rim had a second layer of wood, but it ran, the grain ran opposite direction, sort of like modern day plywood, which would give it a strength so that if it was struck by an edged weapon, it would not split. A split shield obviously is of no use at all. So 
the dory, yes, hoplon, and the linothorax. I would also carry a sword, which I don't have with me at this time. But that's for the loss of your main primary weapon, and then it would be a secondary weapon. The Greeks maintained that formation of a phalanx, eight across, eight deep. The men behind put their shield to the back of the man in front to keep him from being pushed back by the enemy's forces. If you fight in a single row, a single line, it can be easily run through or pushed back, pushed over. But if you've got men behind you bracing you, that will keep you in place and support you against their crush. Now, if I was to have a flat shield, like a Persian carried a flat shield with his hand, and sort of like a, if you want to say, like a garbage can cover, that's the impression you could get. It's a simple hold. Now, it's flat. If he presses against me, and they fought 10 men deep, so he's got nine men pushing on his back against me. I've got my shield here, and I've got seven men behind me pushing. So we're both in the front rank, and now this, we're both of us, are being compressed. I've got 10 men pushing on me from the front, and I've got my seven comrades behind me pushing on me from the back. Now, the man holding the flat shield, such as the Persian, all this is being pushed against him. There's a lot of force there. And finally, it's up against his body. And if there's a compression against the body, front and back, his breathing is going to be restricted. Mine's bowl-shaped. With this, you can press on me all you want, and unless my shield breaks, I can breathe. So who will become fatigued sooner? It's just modern technology of the time. The same thing then, uh, sometimes they would wear, if they had enough money, because all this was private purchased by the soldiers, they would have greaves which cover from the knee to the ankle. A bronze, uh, the metal is springy enough that it would be spread. They'd wrap it around their leg, and the metal would clamp back, clap <laughs> around, clamp, excuse me, back around their leg, holding it in place. That would protect their legs while they're closing the gap between the two armies. If you don't have the money, the next best thing would be to have the curtain type of uh, defense. It would either be leather or a very heavy blanket type material. And that's primarily to obstruct the view of your legs from the enemy so he can't aim at it. Also, stones, javelins, arrows, again, they're not being directly aimed at you. They know approximately where your feet are, but it could help deflect them. And something is better than nothing. And so, but it also allows me um, greater comfort and mobility because the greaves do tend to restrict. The more armor you have, the more restricted you are. The less armor you have, the more mobile you are, but also the more vulnerable you are. So you have to find that happy medium. What's comfortable, what works. So like I said, they fought eight men deep. There's a question on this. Either they fought this way, so that their spears were over, and it would allow me to thrust and come back. And again, the other men behind me. Now, like I said earlier, the butt spike should be heavier, so if the weight is here, I don't really have to worry about my partner behind me, my comrade, getting stabbed in the face. Now, if I center the weapon, you can see how far back it goes. The other technique is overhead, but this is awkward. This is very awkward, even just to hold it. It's also tiring to hold it in this formation. Now, from here, the striking points, again, it's a little, it's not the easiest thing to do, but the striking points would be obviously the head and the upper shoulders. Now, Greeks, when they fought Greeks, they fought other people dressed as I am right here. And again, you can see, now if we were point blank, shield to shield, face to face, there's very little targets other than my eyes or my throat. My linothorax, the yoke on it coming over the top, is double thickness. So that's doubling the protection of my upper chest. Some put shields, or not shields, but scale armor on the sides, because if their arm was up, that's the exposed side. Same reason why the shield is on the left, the little thorax is attached on the left side. It's under the shield, it's protected. The weak spot is doubly protected. The uh, 
fighting this way, it is more comfortable and it does allow me a greater striking ability. So there's the controversy. Which way did they do it? In reality, obviously I wasn't there. I can't say for sure. But I will say this is a heck of a lot more comfortable. And that's the greatest thing about doing these impressions. You can read about it. You get somebody's impression, somebody's idea. And you can look at the pictures and you say, oh, there's a picture. That's why they did it this way. Or is that an artistic interpretation? Again, that's up to debate. Mm -hmm. When you look at the stuff in the museum and you say, wow, that, that's cool. But when you finally put it on, then you realize, hey, it's resting on my shoulder. This is comfortable. I'm not fatigued. The body armor is comfortable. I'm not getting fatigued from this. And you see why things were done, how they were done, and how they acted, and how they interact with each other. So it's a, a great learning experience. If you're interested in history, no matter if it's, uh, what, sports cars or whatever else, you can go to a museum, you look at a sports car, and you go, ooh, that's great. But after that, every time you come there, you go, well, it's nice, but I saw that already. Now somebody hands you the keys and says, go drive that sports car. And that's a completely different experience. And so the same thing with putting this armor on, it's a completely different experience than having just read about it or looked at it in a museum. So basically that's, that's it.